And I think for so many people, what I really encourage them to do is to realize that you're unique. Like you have your own innate qualities. Like there's things about you that are unlike anybody else. There are experiences that you've had that are unique to you. And even if you feel like, oh, somebody else has been through that, or I know somebody else with similar qualities as a package, all combined into one person, there's only one you. And there are people in this world who need what you have to offer. And when you are looking to go out in the world and confidently say like, hey, I'm here to help you. I have this message. I have this story. I have this lesson. That's one of the bravest things you can do because it's, you're putting yourself out there, but you're doing it with the mindset of being of service. Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the ridiculously magnetic Nikki Nash. Nikki Nash is a podcast host, Hay House author, and creator of Market Your Genius, a training and development brand on a mission to equip entrepreneurs with the tools and resources they need to share and profit from their message. Her brand new book, put out by Hay House, also called Market Your Genius, is available all over the place starting tomorrow, August 24th, including at Target. How cool is that? Nikki Nash, you freaking sensation, plus my very dear friend, what the heck do small businesses need to focus on this week? They need to focus on spending more quality time with Annie P. Ruggles. <laughs> I love that answer. Yes, please. Episode over. Now we can all move on with our day. <laughs> but what do they really need to spend time on? What do you week? really need to spend time on? I would say this week, if you really want to either grow your business, like get more clients or be seen as an expert in your industry this week, I want you to make a list of like 10 people uh, that you need to reach out to or say hi to or reconnect with. And every day, reach out to one to two of them. That's what you need to do this week. And then I could be one of those 10 people. Exactly. Fulfilling both of your mandate. Truth. Bam. You know, I love that you're bringing up the idea of reconnection because what happens with me, and I'm sure it happens with a lot of other people too, is some people like you and me, we're galvanized immediately. Like we meet, we're in each other's lives. That's just it, right? But with the majority of people that I meet, not my clients, but the majority of people I meet like networking or something, I meet them. We have a one-on-one. We freaking love each other. We have all of these grand plans and then life gets busy and I totally forget that that person exists. They forget that I exist. And then they post something on LinkedIn two years later. And I'm like, oh my God, I really loved that person. Like, I think reconnection is so important because a lot of us spend a lot of time on initial connection, but then we don't really foster that relationship. Do you agree? Yeah. And, you know, I do have to say that one of the best ways for me to foster relationships, as crazy as it sounds, is having a podcast because then I have another reason to say like, hey, like when I started my podcast, I went to people I knew. I'm like, hey, you're an expert on this thing. And I just started this podcast and we would have such a fun conversation. And so I think, you know, it's an intentional effort to have to go out there and find a way to reconnect with people, but it's not like the person's going to go, wow, you're weird. Why are you reconnecting with me? It's just like, Hey, I thought of you. And I just wanted to send you a message and say, hi, or, Hey, you know, it's been a while. How are you? Like literally tomorrow from the day this is being recorded, not tomorrow from the day you're listening. Um, (laughs) I have uh, a call with somebody who I, we looked at our DMS and we haven't messaged for two years. And literally she just posted something on Facebook asking a question. And I happened to see it when I 
spend time on social media, however often that is. And I went, ah, I'm going to answer that question. And she went, oh my goodness, it's been forever. Let's hop on the phone. And I said, obviously Hi. let's do it. I could not possibly agree more with most of the things you say, let's be honest, but I really couldn't agree more with the idea that podcasting is like the golden gift of networking in both reconnection with people. To your point, you can reach out, you can say, Hey, I finally have a way to showcase you come be on my podcast. Let's talk about whatever you want, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. It's also a really great way to deepen the connection at the beginning. I met a woman yesterday. She specializes in goal setting, but hates the way most people teach goal setting. And I specialize in sales and hate the way most people teach sales. So we hit it off right away. And at the end of that conversation, I didn't have to be like, cool, thanks. Bye. Don't be a stranger. I was like, cool. Thanks. Bye. Come be on my podcast. And for people who are like, Nikki, I don't want to start a podcast. Like this could be anything. You could start an Instagram live show where all somebody needs is an Instagram account, or you have, um, you know, a LinkedIn show or a live streaming, or you pre-record it and throw it up on YouTube or something, you Mm -hmm. know, like there are so many ways. And the reason why relationship building is so important is because if you were take, like had everything taken away from you, tomorrow, except for maybe like your cell phone or, you know, your DMS, you would to regrow a business. You would likely try to connect with people and say, Hey, I'm starting this new business. Like if you had to start over, or even if you want referrals or you want a new client, so often people are like, I need to be on this social media platform because this person told me they made a bajillion dollars posting on social. And I'm not saying that that person didn't make a bajillion dollars posting on social. But what I am saying is that they probably spent a long, long time failing at making any money on social before they had something work. And even if they give you the exact step-by-step plan, you're still going to have to put in the work and do it over and over and over again and tweak it until it works just for you. And so why not pick up the darn phone and continue to build relationships because that's going to be your fastest path to growth or, and happiness. Screw it. If you need anything right now, like just reconnect with people that bring you joy. If you're not an out and out influencer peddling, like you know, other people's stuff. I'm pretty damn positive that the only way you can make a gajillion dollars on social is by fostering relationships. That's what it's for. It's social freaking media, right? And you know what? I also think one thing that you said, which is so totally true, is that this show that you build doesn't have to be crazy. It could be a two minute interview on IG live, right? But also I don't think as a loud introvert, I want to make sure that any of the listeners out there that are like, well, I'm not gregarious and I'm not funny and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. First thing, stop being mean to yourself. Second thing, you can find ways to connect with people on an introvert to introvert level or on a way that is comfortable and boundaried for you. In order to do this kind of relationship building, you don't have to dramatically change who you are. You just have to put yourself out there. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And, you know, it's so funny because I'm sure people are listening and I'm also an introvert and they're like, what? And I was a really shy kid on top of being naturally introverted. And I think for me, it's like when you want to, build a connection with someone. It's about focusing on them and being curious about them. You don't need to be the world's funniest person or the world's best, like Nobel prize winning journalist or something. You just need to be somebody who is curious about the other person and wants to help them out. And so you can, yeah, like just ask them questions. I'm curious. And if you don't have, or the desire to start a show, Okay. Hop on the phone with them. Ask them what they're up to. Oh my goodness. You need this. I actually know somebody who does that. Let me connect you to real quick. You know, just be a value. And, um, that karma goes a long way. And so often people are like, well, how did you get your business growing? I'm like, you know what? I just started being a good human and connecting with other humans. And when I thought of them or could do something for them, I did it with, out expecting anything in return, just unconditionally. And then when one day I woke up and I was like, Hey, actually I could use a favor. They're like, sure. And even if somebody says no, you're like, all right, cool. Well, I asked, they said, no, that's fine. I'll move on to the next person who may be able to help me right now. Right. And you don't take it personally because you don't know what's going on in their lives. But, you know, I tell everybody all the time, introverts are natural salespeople because we're better at listening. 
right? So when you're saying follow your curiosity, ask questions. With my extroverted clients, I love you. You know who you are, but I constantly have to teach them how to shut up because they ask these great questions and then they talk over the answers. We've all done it. It's okay. But with introverts, we really are ready to share the spotlight or deflect it from ourselves, right? But also that deflection can be really dangerous for your business. So your upcoming book, which I have been privileged enough to read ahead of time, Nanny Nanny Boo Boo, everyone listening, is called Market Your Genius. And one of the things that I freaking love so much about your work is it really hones in on people's individual secret sauce, the magic that makes them them. Why do you think so many people are so hesitant to declare their own specialness? You know, I think so often there's a group of people and I would guess that it's a large group of people and I would not be shocked if if statistically it leaned towards, you know, women Mm -hmm. from a gender perspective and minorities from a a ethnicity perspective would not be shocked. I'm not saying this is true, but if I saw those statistics, I would not be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked either. Yeah. We're like this, the self-promotion where that feeling like, Hey, everybody look at me. I'm amazing. is is hard. And the way that I really look at it is that you don't need to be the loudest person saying you're the greatest thing in the world. You know, I watch a lot of Hell's Kitchen and I'm fascinated with how many people are talking like they're the greatest thing in the world and mess up all the time in every episode. I'm like, are you, and then continue to claim that they're the best. I'm like, what are you watching? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you see? What glasses do you have on (laughs) that I do not have on? But you know, power to them. I'm like, you know, kudos to you for being that self-confident or who knows, maybe they're arrogant or delusional. I don't know, but kudos to them anyway, for being like, yo, I'm amazing. And I think for so many people, what I really encourage them to do is to realize that you're unique. Like you have your own innate qualities. Like there's things about you that are unlike anybody else. There are experiences that you've had that are unique to you. And even if you feel like, oh, somebody else has been through that, or I know somebody else with similar qualities as a package, all combined into one person, there's only one you. Yeah. And there are people in this world who need what you have to offer. And when you are looking to go out in the world and confidently say like, Hey, I'm here to help you. I have this message. I have this story. I have this lesson that's one of the bravest things you can do because it's, you're putting yourself out there, but you're doing it with the mindset of being of service. And so I really encourage people to realize when you hold yourself back from doing that, you're actually doing the thing that you claim you don't want to do. Like when you're like, I don't want it to be about me. I don't want to, you know, it to be all about me. Well, you're making it about you because you won't show up in service of other people. Amen. Hallelujah. Take me to church. My God, I tell people all the time, well, I don't want to put my face out there. I don't want to put my voice out there. I don't want to make it about me. And I did this. No judgment, y'all. I did this for years. I ran a fabulous Facebook group for years. And pretty much at the beginning of the episode, I was like, remember, this isn't the Annie show. Why did I do that? Why did I feel like that was going to get other people to take ownership? It didn't. It just confused them. And if they were modeling me, it showed them that they should also be really, really clear in their own space that they're curating with their money and their time that they shouldn't take up that space. And it's like, no, 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 no. Misfiring humility can kill your business. Kill it dead. Right? And I think you're totally right. If I saw a report that said that women and people of color are more likely to not advocate in this way, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I saw a study a couple of years ago that said if they put two people, a white person and a person of color, on a narrow walkway, the person that will stop and move out of the way nine times out of 10 is the person of color. Yeah. And number one, that's heartbreaking. Number two, that's because speaking as a whitey white white here, I know that a lot of the people that I love that are non-white have been taught, do not take up space. You're not safe to take up space. Nobody wants to hear from you. And I feel like by acknowledging this, if you're listening to this and you're a person of color and Nikki, of course, as one, I would love to get your opinion on this. 
I want to implore the people listening, now is the best time for all of us to work together to elevate voices of people that haven't previously been heard. Now is the time to amplify those voices. Talk to me about this from your perspective. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white area um, from the age of about six years old up. Um, And one of the things that I noticed looking back, but I didn't, I wasn't really aware of it at the time is how you, try not to stand out for the wrong reasons. And so I never wanted to be like the angry black woman or like, you know, the, it's bad enough. You know, I remember I was maybe in my late teens or early 20s. Um, I was in Fort Lauderdale or no, I was in West Palm beach with my best friend, um, two of my, two of my girlfriends, but it was my best friend's mom's condo. And we were walking down the street where all like the ritzy stores are. And we went into Louis Vuitton and I distinctly remember feeling uncomfortable being young and in the store because I was getting, I think it was like my mom's birthday and my dad was like, Hey, while you're there, can you get her this thing that she wants? Um, and like check it out and then like bring it back or something like that. And I distinctly feeling like whether it was, whether it was happening or not, I just felt like everybody was watching me and that like, I had to make sure that I was the most non-threatening yeah. Person in the Blend store. Into the wallpaper. Don't upset anybody. Don't even look at anybody. Eyes down, mouth shut. Yeah. And overcompensating, like smiling and trying to like, you know, Ooh. not look like I was too close to the exit or something. Like it was crazy the things that go through my head. But it's like something that I did throughout my life because I didn't want to be seen as threatening or seen as, you know, like um not smart or not good enough or all these different things. And so you just learn to whether it's not like you learn because somebody's teaching you these things, literally like, Hey, Nikki, do this, but you learn their internalized behavior. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. To, you know, put, put yourself down and limit yourself in certain ways to, um, make others more comfortable. You know, and we're talking about relationships and and taking up space and self-advocating and smiling and not talking and just trying to be pleasant and non-confrontational, not seen as a threat. One of the things that I used to be really guilty of is I would go to an in-person networking event and I would only talk to the people that I came with. And I'm like, what the hell is the point of that? Like in hindsight, I'm like, wow, what a phenomenal waste of time. But I use my introversion as a crutch in that way to be like, well, none of these people want to hear from me. So I'll just talk to my friends, drink the free wine and go home. Right. So I think one thing that has been really kind of silver lining advantageous in the COVID era is that so much relationship building is done online now, which is easier to boundary. And it's also easier to be like, hey, I'm Annie for my one minute pitch. And then I get to be quiet again instead of like, hey, I'm going to stand here at the food table and hope somebody talks to me. Yeah. You know, so what do you see in terms of this idea of, of relationship building? If you are uncomfortable putting yourself out there or uncomfortable walking in your zone of genius, how do we reframe that? How the hell do we get out of that behavior? Yeah, I mean, I think practice, for lack of a better um, phrase, makes it more comfortable and and easier for you. And it's like conscious practicing. You know, for me, um, I went to a friend's birthday party and the only person I knew was my friend her husband. And I had met her mother like once maybe before, right? Like that's it. That's who I knew. That was it. And so for me, I have a tendency to when somebody talks to me and we start talking to want to latch onto that person. Yeah. Because then I'm like, okay, at least I know someone. Right. And I, I consciously made an effort and forced myself to start conversations with different people and move around. And even if I was comfortable sitting in one area, talking to someone, I would, after a while say like, oh my goodness, so great talking to you. I'm going to run to get a drink or I'm going to run to the bathroom, like a drink of water or something, or like I would do something to force myself to speak to other people. And it, it was because I know that I'm naturally uncomfortable in those situations. And so it's like going into 
situations with a game plan. People are like, oh, you're so comfortable doing videos and all this other stuff. I'm like, I wasn't at first. I literally, and and one of my <laughs> first uh, business coaches that I had met, um, he asked me to do this. He said, I feel like you would be really great at video. And I was looking at him like he had 50 heads and he's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And so he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to record a video every day. That's your homework on your phone. You can talk about anything you want and send it to me. And so there were videos where I'm like, Hey, I'm recording this video because you asked me to record this video. And I don't really know what I'm talking about right now, but we're going to, we're going to talk through this and let me tell you about my day. Right. And I just would yeah. talk and what ended up happening is after doing that for just five days, I was like, you know what? This isn't so bad. And then I started going live and it was kind of great because at the beginning, nobody's watching your lives live anyway. I mean, maybe you'll get a couple of people pop on and off, but people aren't usually glued in the first time around. Um, for me anyway, uh, maybe other people is different, but. No, and plus even so it's all about that replay. Yeah. Right. True. Like most of it will be seen in the replay. Yeah. So I just started doing it and it's by doing it over and over and over and over again. I got more comfortable. First time I spoke on stages, forget about it. I oh, no. luckily, and <laughs> I guess luckily in high school, I had to do a public speaking course. I think it was like a man. I don't know if it was mandatory or what, but I ended up in this public speaking course and I had to like go up and present and I was like shaking and like ugh, stuttering. And then I somehow ended up in a play and I just forced <laughs> myself to speak. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Have they met me? And now people look at me like, how is that even you? Like you just go places and you're like, I've done speeches where I've been at events and, um, they're like, just go on stage and speak about anything like, cause they want people to get comfortable. Yep. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, All right. Yesterday I had some egg salad and it was delicious. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. I made it myself. Here's the recipe. Like what? doesn't matter. One of my favorite things I ever did. And I'm so glad I didn't talk myself out of it was when I was really trying to get people to do lives at like the advent of Facebook live they were like, no, because like, what if I have something in my teeth or what if somebody says something mean? And I don't know what the hell inspired me to do this, but I think I was just in a moment of frustration with all of them, but like loving frustration. So I went on Facebook live with unbrushed hair, unshowered, and I intentionally took the palms of my hands and rubbed my eye makeup all over my face. And I had on like a t-shirt with holes in it. And the whole point of the video was, if I can look this bad on a live, you won't die. You know, that and actually makes me want to do that. I was like, challenge accepted. Oh, <laughs> it's so, it's liberating. It's truly liberating. And I'm not going to lie and say at the time, I wasn't like, what if my ex-boyfriends see this and they think that they won the post-relationship? Untrue, I win. But I was like, what if? My old mentor who I'm on the outs with sees this and thinks that I'm pathetic. What if I had those thoughts for like four seconds, then I did the damn video and the notes I got after were like, that is the bravest freaking thing I've ever seen. Now I feel like in perfect lighting with hair that I plan ahead of time, I can tell my truth. And I'm like, great. I'm glad that I tried to put a fake booger in my nose for you. Like, what are you going to do? Right? So just put yourself freaking out there. One more question before we transition. Um, I'm wondering, I'm super curious, following my curiosity, as we talked about before, uh, when it comes to sales, which is my lane, a lot of people tell me, this is my quest, my mission, my calling, my vision, my gift, my blah, be blah. I can't sell it. It'll cheapen it. I can't sell it. I can't charge for it. It'll hurt me. Now, your whole thing is marketing your genius. Do you see the same hesitations in marketing when it comes to putting people's goodness out into the world? And if so, how do we fix that? You know what it is? I think it's oddly the opposite. I think people want to market it to death and never make a sale. And uh -huh. I'm like, yo, the whole point of marketing is to get leads so that you can make sales. It's not like just to be seen all the time. I mean, maybe if I just want to, if I'm an influencer and I just want to build a brand and a reputation, I don't need to sell anybody anything because maybe I'm just like, Hey, I just like talking about this and I just want people to know my name. Okay. That's cool. But you cannot pay for food, you know, groceries, clothing, anything that you want or need with 
followers. You can't be like, hey, homie, I have a million followers. Right. Can I have this free pizza now? Thanks. You know, no, like, no. absolutely. You may not. be able to get some people to do it a couple of times if you give them a shout out. But every day for the rest of your life, you might have some problems. Yeah, because this is not American Idol. We don't have a call in line with a popularity contest. We have both been around people that say you can't make any money until you have 20,000 followers on Instagram. I know people that make great money that don't even have Instagram. And I know plenty of people who have 20,000 followers who are broke AF asking for help. You know what I mean? Like really what I would say is that you, and and I know (laughs) this wasn't your question, but I'm going to answer it in terms of like from the sales, yeah, from the sales perspective. I actually think that you're cheapening your magic by discounting it and not offering it to people because you're essentially saying I'm so amazing. I'm so good. This is so transformational and I'm barely going to charge you for it. or I'm not going to charge you for it. And energetically, yeah. like, let's just get real on like an energy. Like we're going woo as people like to say, even though I hate woo, I don't even know what the F woo means. Like I get what it means, but I'm like, who said woo? And then it became a thing. That's a whole nother story. That. But if we were going to go in that direction, like energy and money are like the same, like money has energy yep. and your yep. offering has energy. And if you're saying, Hey, I'm going to give you this really high, amazing, energetic thing. And I'm going to charge you this low energetic thing that's out of alignment. Yes. And you're, you're like messing that S up. You know, I call it the martyrdom of overmarketing. Yeah. Right. Where we're just like, let me give and 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 never receive. And my darlings, that is the quickest pathway to burnout. Yeah. And I'm not saying don't give. I give away tons of free content, Like you know, but I also I'm like, yo, homie, you want to work with me? That's going to cost you money. Here's how you book a call. Here's what the process looks like. Don't book a call with me if you just want free information. Listen to my podcast. That's what it's for. Right. We don't also like I say all the time, if you went into a dollar store and wanted to buy a pair of socks. Awesome. If you went into the dollar store and bought a pregnancy test, would you expect a $1 pregnancy test to be accurate? We devalue things that are way too cheap. If we deem it as too cheap, we don't trust it. Yeah. Right. And I tell people all the time on the same notice, like if I went into the grocery store and there are two seemingly identical things of steak and one of it is $18 and the one next to it is $2 and it's covered in stickers that say special, 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 special. I'm going to think that I'm going to get Ebola or something from eating that $2 steak, even though it's a fabulous deal, I'm not going to trust it. And we do that to our own brands all the freaking time by trying to put our brains in the bargain basement. Yeah. <sighs> feels so good to rant about these things. Attract the people that are willing to pay for you. Yes, there will always be somebody that says you're too expensive, but there's also going to be somebody that thinks you're too cheap. Yeah. So, you know, you might as well charge what you energetically feel is true, not what you're fear and insecurity, you're essentially making decisions from a place of fear and a place of lack. And I am, I don't care if you decide that your thing is $5, but I want you to powerfully choose that it's $5. I don't want you to choose this $5 out of fear. That's my, that's my thing. I was like, I'm not saying woohoo, charge five gazillion dollars. No, I'm saying you have to be in alignment with your pricing. And when you're not, what ends up happening is you have people that buy those cheaper offers. And one of two things typically happens either one, you're so drained over delivering and feeling like you're not getting compensated for it because you're out of alignment with your pricing that you end up not giving people what they ask for, or kind of trying to like half-ass it. And like, that's a whole nother problem. Or you have my friend Shamika Thompson says, uh, PETA, uh, as she said it on my podcast, I think like PETA clients, which seems for a pain in the ass and you end up with a whole yep. bunch of those. And so it's like, yep. if you want a life where you're not working with PETA clients and you're not half-assing your delivery of your method, uh, like your magic, then charge what you energetically, truly energetically without fear. If you were like, this is what I truly believe and know that it's worth offer that. I could not possibly agree more. There is nothing more heartbreaking. And I've witnessed this a billion times and also in my own life, nothing more heartbreaking than a heart centered service obsessed person coming to resent the people they serve 
because they haven't chosen to include themselves in their own success. That breaks my heart into a gajillion, zillion, billion, trillion pieces. Breaks it, right? Because you're like, well, you're just shooting yourself in the foot then Yeah. at that point. Truth. All right. So we have sent out a lot of mandates. We have reframed a ton of stuff. Everyone's going to go make their booger nose videos now so that we can all just normalize the fact that we're human and okay, right? It's totally okay to just be okay. Um, Question that I've waited my entire life to ask you, what does any of this have to do with the long running Angela Lansbury driven gorgeous, amazing, kooky, formulaic, murder a day in up in Maine sensation known as murder, she wrote? Um, first of all, just for people listening, I legit told Annie that I love murder, she wrote, and she wrote me back basically like, what? And I thought it was one of those things where it was, or maybe you wrote, are you serious? And I thought it was one of those things where I'm like, are you about to make fun of me? Because I will go at you. Murder, she wrote is amazing. And it was because you also love it. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm backing Uh, off. I'm backing off. I'm backing off. We can both love Angela Lansbury. (laughs) My desperate, desperate love of my chosen grandmother, Angela Lansbury, is legend. It is well known. People send me Angela stuff in the mail as a gift unprompted because I'll be like, I saw this tank top and it has Angela Lansbury on it and you need it. Like, okay. At least, you know, twice a week, somebody puts something on my Facebook. This week, everyone's putting this like Mordor, she wrote, crossover with Smeagol's face on Angela Lansbury. And I'm like, that is disrespectful. That is so mean. I thought it was going to be something else. Well, I saw the Mordor, she wrote, and then it had like Mordor in the background, yeah. but it was still Angela Lansbury's face. I'm like, you better get Smeagol's face <laughs> off of my chosen grandmother. Don't even go there. No, I would never, ever, ever. I mean, I'm basically the super, super president of the International Angela Lansbury Fan Club, and we're pen pals. I wrote to her and she wrote me back. So no, in my book, she is perfect. May she live for a thousand years. But what does any of this have to do with Jessica Fletcher? You know, what's so cool about J.B. Fletcher is that she, for a elderly woman from Cabot Cove that rode around on her bike, she had a <laughs> reputation for solving murders, right? And like, <laughs> when you really think about it, all we want to do is build our reputation in that which we're really great at and what we're you know, trying to bring into the world. And this chick, you know, I, I love her to death, but when you really look at it, it's like, I don't actually want to go on vacation with you because somebody's going to die. But like, <laughs> but on the flip side of that, like she was known for solving murders and you have, you know, some people are like, oh, here she comes again. I got to get her out of my way. This I've, she's got a reputation for getting all up in there and I, I don't <laughs> want her in my, my way. And then they're like, oh man, she's, she's discovering stuff that I couldn't figure out. She's really good at this. I better, better ask her for some help. But at the end of the day, we could all in our rightful business aspire to be that well-known that people are like, ah, yes, I could use your help. Ah, yes. I know that you're good at this. Ah, yes. J B. And also she's great at both, right? Some people would be like, Oh, J B Fletcher, famous mystery writer. I've wanted to meet you for a thousand years. And other people will be like, aren't you that lady that solves crime? She does both. Yeah. I mean, and, and she doesn't prioritize one over the other. One of them is her job. The other one is just because everyone around her dies. Yeah. <laughs> and if anything, sometimes I think there was an episode where it was like, uh, she was researching something and then somebody died in a similar manner. It's like, why do you know so much about this? It's like, it's, it's helping her out. She researches yeah. for her books and knows stuff. And then, you know, can solve crime in real life. Well, in real TV life. I mean, Michelle McNamara, may she rest in peace, freaking solved the Golden State Killer posthumously by writing a book about it. Bam. It's not beyond the realm of possibility <laughs> that will happen. Truth. I mean, and the other thing is, I think one of the magic, pieces of JB's life is that she also knows who her allies are yeah. and she calls on them and she's fostered those relationships. And for me, I'm thinking about Amos and Seth, Aww. right? So good old sheriffs, yeah. right? Good old sheriff, good old town doc. doc. They're, they're always freaking frustrated with her. She's always frustrated with them. 
some of that sometimes it seems like they want to date her sometimes it doesn't she's not interested she's a widow and happy that way like jb does not have time for no man nope. but when she needs help she knows who to call on and those people come running because she's shown up for them. yeah i mean you got the cia guy that like randomly shows up. I'm like, JB, how do you know somebody in the CIA? Real talk. Like who knows somebody in the CIA that's from a small ass town in, called Cabot Cove and writes murder mysteries? I don't know. I don't. I was really sad when I found out that Cabot Cove is not a real town in Maine. <laughs> I was really sad when I found out that Angela Lansbury was British. <laughs> uh-huh. British Irish. She's both. Yeah. Uh, but no, I... Don't be sad about anything involving her. She's a perfect human. But you know, like it, I just wanted to ride a bike around Cabot Cove and Cabot Cove's not real. So I'm like, Bar Harbor, riding my bike around. Not the same. Not the same. But you know, it's it's so true that like we can explore more than one passion. We can fuse it together. We can be known for more than one truly complimentary thing we can call on the people that serve us she's also brave as hell in like every other episode yeah. somebody tries, tries to, to kill her i'm like damn homie you know you're the murderer because you just tried to kill jb she doesn't even blink <laughs> like she's been almost killed so many times it's like they're like hey come over here and let me brush your hair she's like no you can't touch me I'm J.B. Fletcher. Go away. She doesn't even blink. And then she's like, oh, yeah, they're in the closet. They have a gun. They tried to kill me. Totally calm. And I think there's a lesson in that, too, because you're talking about practice and bravery and putting ourselves out there habitually. I'm sure the first time that somebody tried to kill J.B., she was terrified. But guess what? After the 500th time, she got over it. Yeah. And that's the same with you and your haters. Like the first time it's going to hurt. You know, I even think about book endorsements. Like the first time somebody said no to me, I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, they don't want to read my book. I'm not going to get anybody. And then I was like, Nikki, keep asking people, you know what I mean? Like, right? trust it off, keep moving forward. And, you know, just to touch on something you said before about you can be known for more than one thing. One, you absolutely can. But if you notice JB got known for being a famous author first. Like you kind of have to break through the noise being known for something. And then it was kind of like, oh yeah, I mean, she's solving crime, but uh, she's a w really famous author. And half the time that's what got her in the door. She's like trying to solve a crime. They're like, I'm sorry, ma'am, you got to get out of here. And somebody really important is like, oh my God, I love your books. And it opens doors for them. <laughs> so, you know, get famous on one thing and then that'll open other doors. Also set boundaries with your family. Truth. You know, her nephew, oh my gosh. every single person. Him and his bad nephew, taste in women. My God, all of these women wind up dead or murderers or something. Like, set professional boundaries with your family. One of my favorite questions when people I love ask me stuff, and you and I have had this conversation where I'm like, are you asking me as someone who loves you or are you asking me as someone who's an expert in this space? Because it's not the same. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to be able to vent to me and have me be like, hi, I love you. You're a brilliant genius. What do you need today? And other times you'll be like, hold on, let me put my work hat on. JB's like, let me fly to the side of my idiot nephew anytime, even if I'm on book deadline. Whatever. Boundaries, people. Boundaries. It's the one thing that she does not have quite down. <sighs> I could talk about Murder, She Wrote for the rest of my life and be completely thrilled. Do you, so it's on Amazon Prime. I don't know if you watch it, but every now and then I'm like, I need a binge and I'll just sit there and go through like old episodes on Prime. Yeah, my husband was like, I remember Murder, She Wrote. I think it's pretty good. And I was like, okay, number one, don't you dare say these things to me. And number two, I'll have it on in the background. And he'd be like, oh, watch a Murder, She Wrote. Within two minutes, his butt's in a chair, not moving. And I'm like, thank you. That is the power of Murder, She Wrote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, which makes me happy. It's also a surprisingly, it's, it holds up. It's surprisingly inclusive. It's surprisingly progressive. Yeah. Not every episode is perfect, but JB is for all people. She is. And she, back to relationship building, interestingly enough, she has a friend in like every part of the world. It's kind of crazy. Well, she's a famous author. She's gone on all these book tours. You're going to have the same thing. I mean, I look forward to it, but I'm like, she's in New Orleans and she's like, oh yeah, I'm friends with this, these jazz musicians. It's like, who are you? <laughs> oh my goodness. But you're, you know, 
You're totally right. Sometimes when you get like a, hey, book endorsement and you get a no, that's not an emotional decision for them, but we make it an emotional no for us. We hear the no when we apply pain to it. We apply rejection to it. But also with haters, you never know what's going on in their weird brains. They may be certifiably mentally unwell. They may just be a tremendously unhappy person. They may derive pleasure from trying to knock other people down, but most of the time they're completely missing the boat. Yeah. Or, or often, and my nose weren't like a mean no, it was like, you know, I just, I have a lot going on right now and I don't have the time to commit to reading the book, but like in the time frame that you need it done. It was like, they were all yeah. nice, but I was like, <laughs> you just are trying to be nice to me. I'm like, oh yeah. Stop being but ridiculous, they, they Nikki. Missed the boat. <laughs> yeah. You know, they missed the freaking boat in that I remember when I worked the reception desk at Broadway in Chicago when I was super young. I will never forget this for as long as I live. The Lion King, the Julie Taymor Broadway version of The Lion King was in town. And I took my dad for Father's Day and it was like amazing. And both of us were sobbing hysterically. And I got on the phone the very next day and a woman called and she was irate. I rate. And for anybody that hasn't seen the Julie Taymor Lion King, there's a lot of really huge, amazing puppetry going on. And in Circle of Life, there is a giant procession of animals and they come down the center aisles. And this woman called and she was so pissed. She's like, I demand a refund right now. Total Karen. I demand a refund immediately. The show was so disappointing during Circle of Life, which was the only number I was looking for- forward to. There was an elephant blocking my view. And I was like, bitch, the elephant is the view. (laughs) You're supposed to be looking at the animals. Like, how lucky are you that you get to see the elephant, which is like the crowning achievement of like five different puppeteers? What? 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 Or like our beloved coach Jenny got a YouTube comment the other day because she's got a bunch of Barbara Streisand stuff behind her. And they said, I would never take advice from someone who listens to Barbara Streisand. What? That is so weird. Okay. Well, you just deprived yourself of watching a really great and meaningful video because you're being weird. All right, fine. Go ahead. But it's like, haters are not really hating on us. A lot of the time they're hating on themselves or a lot of the time they're just trying to talk and be heard. Yeah. Because if you're not going to work with someone because you don't like their musical preferences, then you have a whole nother problem you have a whole nother problem. I can understand if you don't like someone's politics or how they treat people times a billion, but their musical preference? Come on. All right. I got to wrap this up and release you back to your day, but I have two more questions for you. Let's do it. On the advent of this incredible book launch of yours, you're on tour and someone around you gets murdered. What's the first strategic choice you make towards solving that murder? Well, first thing I would probably try to do is figure out who they are and how they were murdered. Like, was it poison? Was it a stabbing? Like all that jazz? Like I need those details. And then I'd probably go deep into trying to figure out who had motive and who had access. And then because I feel like I've watched way too many murder mysteries across all television networks. And I'm talking like psych down to like the mentalist and Angela all Lansbury, of all of the things, the Hallmark channel, you always have to just be open to an out of the box killer. And so I would also, yeah. right. So I would, I wouldn't assume that anybody did it. I would, you know, look for who had access, who had motive, and then try to dig a little bit deeper because there's sometimes like somebody who you least expect that has something to gain. And for my comfort, as someone who dearly loves you, please just don't go anywhere alone because they may try to kill you when you figure it out. Yeah, that is real true. Real true. Um, If I do go alone, I'll make sure that I am fully equipped with some like kick butt crazy martial arts. And um, and intuitively, I feel like I might know that somebody's following me and I'll make sure that I'm like. I have hiding skills or something as well. As long as you're safe. Thanks, love. Next question. Please, please, please tell all of our listeners who definitely don't want to kill you because no murderers listen to this podcast. How can they get in touch with you? And please feel free to just gush about your brilliant, gorgeous. Oh, well, thank you, love. 
I am super freaking proud of this thing. It's one of those, uh, I don't have kids, but I, I have had many of friends have kids and have been close with them during their pregnancy. And it's kind of one of those things where like writing a book, like once you get the ball ro- ro- uh, rolling and you're like, the book is happening. It's like, there's all these little things that happen that you're like, had I known all of this was going to happen, I might've rethought doing this in the first place. So like I have friends who are <laughs> like, oh my gosh, if I knew I was going to feel this terrible, or if I was going to have like this loose feeling in my fingers or like get this big or be this nauseous, I might've rethought this whole thing, but it's like too late. Right. Yeah. That's how I, I felt about uh, the amazingness of this book where I'm like, well, we've already, we've already gotten pretty far. So we just got to keep the ball rolling. Cause there's no so, back yeah, so much goes into creating this. It's a, it's a true labor of love, but I am so proud of it. It's called market your genius. It literally, if you are listening to this on the day that it airs, it comes out tomorrow, August 24th. I am so freaking excited, but if you buy a copy of the book today, or if you've already done it, um, head to market your genius, uh, book.com. And you can type in, you know, like uh, that you have bought the book and your whatever number, the thing that they give you, that's like, here's the, thingy, the barcode the or whatever. You type all that in and there are some sweet kick butt bonuses that literally go away today. Like this is the last day I'm offering them. And I'm talking like hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of bonus material. That is really epic. And if you happen to listen to this after August 23rd. And you're like, WTF, Nikki, don't worry. There's still some magic that comes um, when you buy the book. It's just really freaking kick butt uh, when you do it on August 23rd. Well, it has my full endorsement. It, I mean, my endorsement's in print, but if you're listening, I love this book. I love the warmth of it. I love how accessible and practical and purposeful it is. It's got really excellent strategies and it's got a ton and ton of heart. So I couldn't recommend it more. Go buy that copy today. Seize those bonuses. You will not, not be disappointed. It is truly JB Fletch quality. Thanks, love. Thanks. You are so welcome. Nikki, it has been such a pleasure talking MSW, Ange Lands, and your brilliant brilliantness with me. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Heck yeah. Everybody, I will be back in just a second with my final thoughts and your homework for the week. Well, hey there, listeners. Entrepreneurship can be so draining, y'all. All the creativity, all the fake or genuine extroversion. Let's not even talk about asking for money. Barf. This career and lifestyle hybrid that you are hand carving feels especially nasty when your inbox is empty, your bank accounts depleted, and burnout is sizzling. My new clients and friends often confide their frustrations in me. I can't believe that lead ghosted on me. They seem so excited. Or I really put myself out there at that networking event, but nobody got back to me. Didn't they like me? Or Debbie was my biggest fan and my paycheck, and I haven't heard from her in months. (laughs) Can you relate? But all too often, those exact clients turn around and tell me, well, I didn't want to be pushy, so I didn't ask yet. Or... I was waiting for them to get in touch with me, you know, so I don't bug them. And I'm spending all my time and my last dime trying to bring in new leads. And I don't reach out to my network. They should have seen it in my Facebook group. Simply put, they crave attention and connection and cash. And yet they don't follow up all those leads, all that energy, all that time and great rapport flush down the great funnel known as the toilet. And why? Why? Because follow-up requires creativity, vulnerability, and time. Your homework this week is to take me up on my offer to take the guesswork out of getting back in touch. I've created five templates for low-pressure, relationship-based, no-nonsense emails. 
or letters if you want to go snail mail that you can send to folks hanging out on your metaphorical fences. Estimated time of project, mere minutes per lead. Energetic output required, next to none. Just fill in the blanks, choose the best words for your brand, and voila. But remember, you don't get credit this week for just writing the email. You have to actually send it to. The link to my templates is in the show notes. Enjoy, happy sending, and happy selling. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the non Sleazy Sales Academy and me, Annie P. Ruggles. What if you never had to sell alone again? If you always felt safe and seen and supported in selling situations because you only had to show up as your best and also most ordinary self. You can profit just by being you without one gimmick, one inch of sleaze. To find out more about our membership, visit www.nonsleazy.com. That's nonsleaz Com. Too Legitimate to Quit is written and hosted by me, Annie Passanisi Ruggles. Our editor and producer is Andrew Sims of Hypable. Our incredible earworm of a theme tune was composed and performed by Riley Horbasio. Our beautiful show art is by Francois Vigno. And my beautiful, wonderful, amazing creative director, Georgia Curran, handles my social media accounts with care. Listen, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear how your homework is going, what you think of the show, or what topics you'd love to see covered here. Feel free to reach out to me on any platform with messaging, but the best for me are LinkedIn, where you'll find me under my name, Annie P. Ruggles, or on Instagram, where you'll find me at Anniepreneur. And please don't forget to send this show to people that you think would benefit or to drop us a review wherever you listen to podcasts that really helps our show grow. Until next week, remember, you're too legit to quit.